I began the painting in 2005, and it was a, a period in my life when I, I felt um, a, a compelling need, a big need to, um, to take stock of where I was as a painter, as an artist. And this also corresponded with an irritation that I began to have on another level with something about the relation to um, repetition in my work. And so by the time 2005 came, I thought, why do I always have to uh, paint things in series? Or why do I always have to, what is it about repetition? And I became very interested in making a painting that was a singular painting where it just could not be repeated. I could not make another kind of series with it. And so I thought, well, how am I going to do that? And I thought, well, if I made a painting that was just so big, so enormous, I absolutely wouldn't have it in me to make another painting like it. And so, um, and so I embarked on black and white. And when I was doing the, the drawings of it, I thought, well, it would have to be, the painting would have to be, from a practical point of view, um, worked on panels. And they would have to be kind of joined together. So just to sum up uh, from that point of view, the painting came out from two impulses. One, the need to kind of make a manifesto, if you like, to show what I really thought about painting. And um, good evening and welcome to our third uh, Thinking About Talk of the Series. Um, tonight, we welcome an audience here both locally based here in London and also from across the globe, including refugee camp in Kenya. Sorry for that little interference there. Um, this week we go behind the scenes and delve into the mechanics of the artist in her studio. Um, the studio for many artists is an intimate space, a place of sanctuary, focus and growth, where many experiments, inspirations and failures sort of hang around, maybe never coming to fruition, but also with the possibility that they will trigger the next stage of the creative process and be that light bulb moment at a certain point in time. The studio can be where the frustrations, the irritations, a lot of perseverance, perseverance and more often than not, the magic happens. So you've just seen a glimpse of that magic in the clip we have watched of Lisa's most recent exhibition, Ensemble, together at FRAC, Octi and Montpellier in France. Black and white, the 22 meter long painting focused on the motif of the studio and acting like a manifesto, aiming to embody the totality of Lisa's experience of painting as it was in 2005, when she made this monumental work. Um, we've not one, but two artists with us this evening. Um, Lisa, of course, whose career spans over 40 years under the umbrella of still life, though she endlessly bends these roles, pushing the boundaries of the genre. Lisa's work will be more fully explored uh, with Gabriel Hartley, our second artist, who will be taking us on the tour with Lisa in her studio at home. Gabriel, also a painter, works liberally within the genre of landscape and like Lisa, he tests the limits of themes and media quite literally scoring, cutting and sanding into surfaces. His paintings combine optical effects and iconic markings on highly textured surfaces. A certain brutal element is required in the making, followed by the emerging of sublime and often delicate outcomes. In Gabriel's paintings, there are echoes of old masters, abstraction and impressionism, whilst also drawing on cultural inspiration from around the globe, Japanese woodcuts and Indian miniature painting, to the street art and marks of London where he currently resides. Whilst resonating past and present environments, they evoke memory and imagined places and are distinctly fresh and contemporary with a deeply visceral impact. So Gabriel is well known to us here at the college, as is Lisa, and we hoped he would join us this summer as our artist in residence. And though this timeline um, has changed and how it might manifest is in a limbo state, we're very excited to have Gabriel with us in a virtual capacity and hopefully over the coming weeks, he will begin to share his behind the scenes practice. Now, just before I hand over to Gabriel and Lisa, um, at the end of the tour and the talk, we will have a Q&A hosted by students Gabriel Rahman and Emilio Nunzi. So please send your questions in via the chat um, at any point during the talk. Um, Lisa, 
We would also love to hear any insights or observations you may have about her work, things that perhaps spring to mind about objects or painting coming from your own experiences. So please feel welcome to contribute all comments, not just the questions. Um, I have literally have Gabriel um, socially distancing here with me. So I am going to hand over to him um, and Lisa, and I hope you enjoy this tour as much as I'm sure we all will. Thank you. Hi, Lisa. How are you? Hi, Gabriel. Nice to see you. Where, where are we at the moment then? Um, I am in my kitchen and my living room here in East London. And um, first of all, I would very much like to um, thank Sue and everybody at Dulwich for um, uh, the, such a lovely welcome and this wonderful invitation to um, to meet you all on the screen um, this afternoon and it's been wonderful getting to know you too Gabrielle as we prepared for this. Um, so enormous thanks to Sue and um, everyone at Dulwich and thank you everyone for joining this afternoon. It's hard to imagine that such a wonderful crowd of some Close to 100 people, I think, um, have registered for the visit. And um, so thank you again so much for joining us today. So yes, Gabrielle, we are in my kitchen and um, I'm, my studio is under the same roof as my living space. So I thought I would take you from the kitchen to the studio. Brilliant, let's go, let's have a look. So, in fact, there are two routes from the kitchen here, the kitchen living room, as it were. How's this pace for moving around? That's great. Yeah, yeah, we can see it, see it perfectly. Okay. So, there's a short route from this area here in the house. Um, the short route and the long route to the studio. And I thought I would take you on the long route. So, we're going to leave um, the living domestic space. We're going to hang a left and again another left and this is the hallway leading to my studio which is also serves as our library wonderful books and my studio is here so welcome everybody into my studio Um, I thought, Gabrielle, I would just give a little bit of history about the studio in that I've been in this particular um, building for the past 20 years. So for the past 20 years, I've, I've had my studio um, under the same roof of, as my house. And as you can see by the setup of the building, there's a very nice sort of separation between the living space and the studio space. And so um, I never feel um, oppressed or squashed by having the, the living and the, um, and the studio work so close together. Um, it really suits me these days. I've had um, other studios. I've, I've worked in about seven studios since I, um, since I left um, since I left art school in the, in the early 80s. And, um, and each one has been a dream studio in itself. And I really appreciate it for the qualities that, have had, uh, that it's offered me. So sometimes, you know, I've had to, I've taken my bike um, to the studio, or I've walked, taken the bus, and that distance has really suited me um, very well. And in fact, um, I've done lots of paintings that are about the studio as a motif. Um, the one that you saw at the beginning here um, of, the, of, the, uh, of this visit now, the film clip from the exhibition I had last February in, um, in Montreal. Montpellier is a huge painting about the studio and I know that when you saw this um, clip Gabrielle you sent me some wonderful comments about it and perhaps we could pick those up at, at the end of, of, the, of the tour today um, but, um, but anyway um, as I was saying that to have the studio here under the same roof especially I feel especially so lucky and fortunate to have it during the time of 
of uh, being in lockdown and COVID and being able just to be in the studio all the time sort of without um, without any struggle to, to get to it in this way. Um, I love being able to come into the studio whenever I feel like it, um, to work whenever I have a need or a desire to work. Um, I love being able, the flexibility that having it under the same roof offers me of, of being able to, um, for example, um, I teach on the graduate program at the Slade School of Fine Art. And um, it's great to be able to come home at the end of a day of teaching and simply pop in to see something on the go or uh, something, um, that I, something that I need to uh, finish from a technical point of view, something like that. Or often it's lovely just to come in and sit um, without anything to do but soak up, um, soak up the atmosphere. So I've only had one studio that had a, I found had a terrible vibe and um, I had to leave it after three months of being in it. It was a very um, bad judgment call on, on my part when I decided to move in. Um, but the feeling and the atmosphere of a place and the energy, of course, is really, is really interesting to consider too. Um, it'd be um, great to have a little bit of a look around to see how the rest of the studio fits together, Lisa. Could you just show some, some more that's going on in, in here? Of course, with pleasure. Um, so as you can see, um, this part of the studio here is, um, is the main sort of working area. And to the back of the studio is um, storage. So there's lots of different kinds of way of storing work. Um, work, uh, th these, these are all um, 3D type paintings. And a lot of them are to do with different installation paintings that I've done. And so this is, and they all often involve um, the motif of clothing, a dress in this case. So this is where they are stored. Um, paintings are stored in racks. They're stored on tubes here. Um, and might just creep out. Um, actually, Gabriel, before we advance any further into the back, I just wanted to um, talk about um, talk about the conditions for working in here before we, we before we move on. And I realized that when we entered the studio space, what I didn't do was turn on the lights. Mm -hmm. And the light is one of the first things that I, the quality of light is one of the first things that I notice whenever I come into a room. And I really wonder what you yourselves notice when you first enter a space. Um, and, but the lights that I use here, um, and I've always used, are fluorescent tubes. And I don't know if you, you can see in the, in the um, screen, but they're warm and cool. So it's a kind of a, a, a good mix of warm and cool um, to create what I feel is kind of a neutral light. And when I first moved into the studio, um, there used to be windows on this wall here. But um, as time went on, I, I found I needed more wall space. And so I, I, I sacrificed two of the windows um, to build the walls here. But the light coming in from, this, from the two windows at the top are sufficient to mix with the fluorescent lights. And for me, um, it's important that the space is evenly lit, not just one wall or, or one kind of area, but there, there's an even kind of light throughout. Um, you'll notice these ropes here. They were, um, I put them up when I was developing um, a painting that was basically constructed with banners of paintings hanging from the ceiling. And, um, and then once I'd finished the painting and, um, and uh, moved on to other things, these ropes became very useful for hanging other, other sort of elements um, as time went on for other work. Um, so, um, so that's the lighting. And, oh, of course the studio chair. <laughs> This one has followed me around now for a number of years. I think it's about 15 years old. And the studio chair is an absolutely essential part for me of the studio setting in order it's just to kind of- It's not a very comfortable chair, Lisa. It looks like quite a, um, it's, not a, it's not a lounging chair. 
It's not a lounging chair, but it actually has got a lovely curve to it. So it's got the right kind of balance of being um, comfortable, but um, sort of cultivating an alert sense of, of focus um, for, for just contemplating things or musing or enjoying the coffee, of course. And also I wanted to flip on the lights because it's quite dark in the back of where I'm gonna take you now into the back of the storage. Um, and so um, need the light to show you what's going on here. Um, this wall here is like, um, it's like a catch-all area. It's like a 3D sketchbook. And I put up paintings here that are finished or that I'm just thinking about things that are on the go um, there are lots of experiments. Lots of these are 3D paintings, like this one here, which uh, is a painting that can move. Um, and uh, this painting here, I started about 15 years ago, and I know that I've got to put the highlights on the orange and finish darkening off the mold, but for some reason I just haven't got it in me to finish it. So it's just been sitting there waiting. Um, for me to complete. Um, do these but, come out at different times and you kind of switch around this sketchbook? Yes, things come and go or things kind of stay, um, but it's kind of something that's on the move. Um, and then as we go through here to the back, this is the plan chest. And in the plan chest um, are all my um, uh, prints and drawings in portfolios. And there are lots of uh, paper storage here. There's um, works that have been rolled up. There is uh, a, a sort of a storage for 3D type paintings again. Um, more paper, more portfolios. And, um, and then we come into this. Oh, this is the angle of the storage from this point of view. And I have to say, um, it's kind of, Coming in here is kind of like going time traveling because there are paintings here from uh, the 1980s. Um, this is a, a painting of stamps from, um, from the 80s that was last shown at Tate Liverpool in a show that I did there in 2001. And you can see that it's still in its travel case. And I haven't had the need to open up or the urge or being even curious to, to look at it since then. Um, there are paintings, um, so there are paintings from the 80s in here that are in storage. Um, there are paintings that I'm just working on right now that are here in storage. Some of them, um, the paintings are wrapped, some naked if you like, some on tubes. So very, very different ways of kind of handling the paintings themselves. Uh, obviously the sink, <clears throat> excuse me, and um, there's uh, tools here on the wall and um, there's lots of examples of different kind of canvases. It's very, very wonderful to think about so many, all the different surfaces and supports that you can use to make your painting from aluminium panel to, um, to wood um, to, to uh, um, fabrics. And this, for example, is sort of a test zone showing um, different kinds of surfaces mixed with different kind of gra grains and sand um, just so that I have it as a kind of a catalog um, reminding me of my options. So there's lots of tools to work with um, and then um, over, over here we have um, more art supplies along here on the shelf lots of art supplies and um, actually I love I love being organized with this and I don't I don't think it's because I'm a neat freak I think it's because I really enjoy um, I really enjoy order um, it opens up space in my mind I it, the ordering of things and the arranging of things allows me to really value and cherish all the wonderful um, tools of the trade and 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 all the materials that um, that go into making the painting. It also means that when I want something like spray mount, I know exactly where it is so I don't have to waste time getting it. And then up here is my picture library. And um, over the years, I've collected many books of images or things that relate to my paintings. Um, and then there are uh, photographs. 
um, that I've also used periodically throughout my work. And I used to take loads of pictures with uh, my camera um, and um, stopped using um, um, analog photography about 2005 when I went digital. And so now all my photographs are kind of on my camera. And so the studio storage continues on in the back here. I would supply all sorts of different stands for 3D installation based paintings and objects. So um, that basically the layout of this of the of what the studio looks like. Oh, and safety as well. Um, and so here we are back in in the in the working and looking space. Brilliant. Um, Lisa, it'd be great to um, just get a bit of an overview of kind of the work, some of the themes you sort of thought through over the years, kind of how it's changed a bit. Okay, thank you. Um, so, uh, what I, to do this, um, what I would like to do is, I'd like to start with a painting that I made uh, in 1981, when I was a student at art school at Goldsmiths College in London. And um, I, I, it's a painting of, um, can you see it? It's a painting of a matchbox partially open to reveal a cluster of matches inside. So um, I've actually written something to read you now. So I'm going to just sort of um, revert to reading you a text about my work, um, just in order to, um, to give you an idea about where I'm coming from as a painter. So still life um, is the term that I use to describe my approach to painting, reflecting my interest in the human relation to objects. And through my engagement with painting objects, uh, spending concentrated periods of time on describing objects in paint, it's led to a deep fascination in the experience of painting itself. What defines painting and what forms painting might take, exploring the subjects of materiality and transformation and the different art histories and traditions of painting around the world. So at the heart of my work are two interconnected focus points. My interest in objects and the everyday, and my interest in the activity and the experience of painting. Some of the themes that have grown out of this focus and that characterize my paintings center around notions of presence and absence, existential states of connection and disconnection, loss, the subject of time, and questions of representation and how we come to know or not know things. Questions of identity, of the relation between same and different, and the individual and the group. So when I look at this little painting of the matchbox, I feel that all these concerns are somehow located within it and that I've been painting the same painting ever since 1981. It's as if I will end up making the same painting forever. So on one hand, I feel that the sustained focus is a kind of a wonderful affirmation of something deeply personal in my life that really belongs to me, giving me a meaningful way of being in the world out of which other activities and understandings may grow. Conversely, this enduring preoccupation can somehow make me feel just the opposite, feel kind of flattened, deadened, as if trapped in a state of perpetual, a perpetual state of repetition where nothing ever changes. But I think this set of dual feelings of feeling very alive and connected and feeling very shut off and disconnected here and there, on and off, is what drives and underpins my work emotionally. And so, um, Gabrielle, I thought that I would now um, continue um, with um, the overview by showing you um, some images in this catalog. How does that sound? 
Great. That's brilliant. Yeah, could you, yeah there was, you were going to give a bit of an overview of kind of how, um, of, of, this was a catalogue from the show, wasn't it, in, um, in Montpellier, is that right? No, this is one that um, is much, much earlier. Um, this is from the Tate Liverpool show that I mentioned um, when we were looking in the storage. Um, and I, I, I um, discovered my, my stamp painting in there in its traveling case. So this show, this catalog was produced by Tate Liverpool in 2001 when I did a, a survey show of my work there. And um, so, I'm going to, so I, as I mentioned um, via the matchbox, I began to develop my uh, approach to still life at art school, um, painting the everyday objects around me like the matchbox. However, it was only when I left art school that I felt my paintings really began to take off. And I think this was due to the way that I changed my method of painting. So I stopped painting from objects, from observation, set up on a table in front of me, and began to paint um, from an image of an object that I held in my mind, how I imagined it. By not having the object in front of me um, and instead picturing it in my mind, I felt liberated in how I could engage with the activity of painting itself. I felt less duty bound to rep represent an object in what I assume was a correct way. And this helped open me up to the feel of the paint and the pleasure of making. So by holding an object in my mind, it meant that the brush marks I applied to the canvas became very closely allied to the image that I pictured with my mind's eye. By picturing the object as such, a kind of editing took place and the visual information that settled in my mind was somehow the best kind of information to fuel the poetry of my paintings, downloaded through my imagination and embodied in material form through touch and my handling of the paint on the canvas. This discovery was really hugely exciting to me um, and it really um, and the new way of working it it really up to my enjoyment of painting and, and the sheer fun of painting so all the paintings that we see here reproduced in the catalog um, were made more or less from how I pictured them and they also stemmed from the most part from the objects that populated my everyday world in some way aside from this one, which I just really wanted to paint softness, deep softness. And so the idea of a fur coat with the sharp talons of a shoe to contrast with the softness really appealed to me. But anyway, um, this, this sort of relation to the, um, the objects that were, that were kind of around or available to me in a very sort of day-to-day -day way, um, they, um, through this, this, um, this availability, I felt a very strong sense of identification um, or personal connection to them. Yet because these objects weren't um, actually physically there in front of me when I painted them, they were absent. They also stirred up in me a curious sense of loss, of something missing or disappeared. So the dual set of feelings that emotionally underpin my work, as I mentioned, revolving around presence and absence, connection and disconnection, are at play in my paintings right from the start. So my early paintings, as you've seen, started off as depictions of single objects that grew into piles of objects, lines of objects, and then um, finally... Um, this is a, a very a big painting that was I did at the time. It's about maybe um, eight feet long or so. So finally, they, they then um, focused on a grid or a random scatter. And through these depictions, I enjoyed exploring the subject of collections and display methods, of shopping, 
of our relationship to wanting things, needing things, acquiring things, objects that are functional and objects that are decorative. And as you might well have noticed by now, the subject of repetition um, became central. So as time went on, towards the end of the 80s, for example, I began to want to paint things um, alongside the objects, such as cityscapes or portraits or landscapes and scenes of everyday life. And eventually I found a way of um, incorporating these, um, these kind of um, motifs into my work by selecting objects that are characterized by um, a motif or a picture etched, printed, painted, or cast onto its surface. Um, like these postage stamps or Greek vases or my favorite Japanese prints uh, and um, which continue to be a source of inspiration to this day. So then as time went on in the 90s, I continued to test and develop my approach to still life by turning the imagery of landscapes and portraits um, into, um, into uh, the scenes um, uh, of, of everyday life, of, of into a form of still life themselves. So I found a way of thinking about buildings, for example, facades as a kind of a still life, interiors, Um, people. Um, places. London. And it sort of led to the realization that, um, that for me, still life is less to do with a traditional singular focus on objects and instead sort of operates more as a, a kind of a mindset that's shaped by relation to materiality and to the interplay between looking and making and to time in the everyday. And I also grew more interested in painting as defined by its dual aspects of looking and making. And how a painting operates is both a kind of a noun and a verb. As, a, as an object, a noun, or a noun, a painting is something to look at. And as a verb, it's an action, it's something to do. And this duality is held in the very term still life, embodying both the contemplative still and the performative life aspects of painting. And um, this perspective has fostered a current focus in the studio of creating um, paintings that include uh, both um, that include a performance component or an interactive audience participation component. Um, at, and the, such as the painting that we're looking at at the end here, which, I'll be, which I'm really looking forward to showing you um, shortly. But my comments on, on the making aspect of painting, and this was called Painting a Picture that I did in 2000, um, brings us now um, to um, the, um, the importance for me of craft and the tools of the trade. And now I am very excited to introduce you to my palette. Can, are you, um, is this pace good? Can you, are you hearing me well? Is it going okay from that point of view? Yeah, it's very good, Lisa. Sorry, but yeah, I was, I was, I was on mute. I tried to talk. I'm just saying it'd be great to see, see the, um, some of the methodology because it, it, it's kind of very revealing to kind of how you think about um, the world and how you approach, approach it, really. Great. Well, um, since we've been, we've been, uh, I've been talking about painting as both a sort of the experience of looking and making, I thought that I would now focus on, 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 the, on the palette itself. And this palette is a mobile palette. So it, it's on wheels and I can move it around the studio wherever I need it. Um, and, and the top part here, as you can see, um, is, the, is the palette itself. And here are, um, underneath it are, are brushes, a store of paint, 
that comes from the shelves that I showed you early over on the other side of the studio, and all sorts of tools that I might need for stretching, um, putting up things on the wall, um, drawing materials, um, stuff like that. So it's very, very handy to have it all sort of in one, in one sort of go, if you like. And this is the way that I clean the brushes. Um, kind of low odor solvent in in two um, in two buckets and you can see that they've got a, a chicken wire basket that's been sort of pinched in and the basket sits, sits about this far from the bottom and the brushes kind of sit within it and all the sludge from the brushes just sort of sinks to the bottom it's kind of a standard thing that um, that many painters use in order just to sort of keep the brushes sitting in a relatively clean um, clean um, liquid for, for um, cleaning the brushes and I have one that I just use solely for cleaning white and the other one for cleaning um, the colors so in order to keep the color really clear and fresh it's really important to have a good system I find for cleaning the brushes and um, I've set up um, my, my palette never looks like this in fact my studio never looks like this and I've just set it up for you today as well so um so it's we have a, a pleasure. look at can we have a look at some of those things actually lisa but in a bit more depth sure i mean it's a it was a pleasure for me to kind of um think of you uh, coming here and being able to kind of um um share my pleasure in in the paint itself with you via the palette and so i use a, um, a kind of a range of paints and i just put them out here for you to see but of course when i'm working all the tubes are kept underneath here um, but for now it's just to show you um, the range of paint and how I set it up. Um, some tubes are small, some tubes are big and um, the cool colors are kind of along the top flanked by the white and then the, the, the warm side is along here and um, um, I, um, uh, I mix the paint with Gamsol which is a sort of I guess the healthy option of a solvent of a solvent and I love I use linseed oil and then mix the two together um, sort of like a salad dressing com combined with oil and vinegar I can't hear you Gabrielle Can you hear me now yeah no I can't hear you I can't hear you so yeah hi Lisa hi well, uh, so yeah, would it be possible to do the painting demo that, we, that you were um, that you were planning? So I think we're going to have to go to questions in about five minutes' time. So be, okay, be, um, um, the painting demo. Oh, there's so many things to tell you about. Um, so the painting, I've got a brush mark workshop for you, and uh, the, my brushes, of course, are absolutely key. And the the palette is fabulous for um, for. Um, experimenting and seeing what um, a brush can do. This is a fabulous color of indigo and the palette is really really good just for um, mixing and experimenting with paint and the brushes that one has are um, um, it's really fabulous to get to know what the brush can do and to see what a small brush can do what an um, a, a old brush does, old brush makes a very, very different line than um, a very brand new brush. Um, the, the, the palette acts like a test bed where you can um, mess around and have fun just simply exploring what paint does. When you add different things to it, When you press, when you, when you just look and see what the texture of paint does, um, can give you so many ideas for the painting itself. Um, so again, I've developed um, a workshop that I'm longing to give you. Um, I've got a lot more to say about brushes, about the different size of them, again, about how an old brush um, can produce just the right kind of mark that you want, um, as opposed to a brand new brush. Um, 
thinking about how paint comes out of the tube and how you and how you um, you can enjoy it just on the palette itself. I always buy my titanium white in liter sizes and look what happens over time to a spoon that is always dipped in this gorgeous stuff of the paint here. Um, so that is something about the palette. And before we go to the questions, there's just two more things I'm longing to show you. Something about the work that I've set up now. Um, this is a painting that I brought out to show you. All the paintings here in the studio setting are uh, about uh, the, the motif of clothing, which has been a recurrent motif in my work for, uh, for many years. Well, ever since the 80s, as you might have noticed from the catalog. This painting is from 1990. Uh, and um, when you look at it, I wonder if you think I'm painting one single shoe over and over again or if it's dozens of the same kind of shoe. Um, I wonder when you look up close to it, what you think is the first mark that I made and what the last mark that I made is. Um, the shoes have followed me all through the years. And this is a painting, a, a, fra a fragment of a floor painting um, that I did in 2016. And this is what it looks like it has a, um, when it's fully um, displayed for you, I just brought out a section of it to give you an idea of it. And um, it has a wall component and then the, the, the floor component. And this one involves real shoes um, that I've had so much fun painting a pattern background for. And the real shoes makes, gives a very different sense of presence. Um, you really feel that um, that, that, that perhaps somebody is, is kind of there. Um, and painting like this, you kind of feel maybe nobody is really, is, is, is nobody is really there quite so much. And so it became very interesting to think about um, how to incorporate real objects into the painting and also test the threshold between uh, life and art, um, between, again, here and there. Um, and so on. This painting is from 2016. Um, it's a painting, as you can see, um, of a swimming, swimming pool and a cloud of, of, um, of uh, swimming suits above it. Uh, there's something again about, um, in this painting, I, I was thinking about body memory and how it, with all the actions of painting that we use, um, which actions we use over and over again out of enjoyment, out of habit, um, how memories become locked in the body um, as much as other memories which are more of a visual nature. Something about objects which are to do with stillness and movement in themselves. Um, when the swimming suit is off me, it's still. When I put it on and plunge into the pool, it becomes, um, it becomes of, my, of my body and full of movement. Um, and there's something again about sort of memory within this and all the different swims that one has when you plunge into a pool, is there something about all the other swims you've had that comes to mind? Um, finally, this painting here, which is an interactive painting. As you can see, there are four um, object paintings hanging on the wall. They're, they're sort of, um, a, sort of a, a painting which is object and, um, and painting uh, sort of combined together, if you like. And what happens is that the viewer comes along and considers the composition on the wall here, and um, they're invited via wall text to interact with it, to change it, to test it, to maybe come up with a combination or a composition that is more um, pleasing to them. By going over to the clothes rack here, rifling through and looking, deselecting a dress from the wall, and putting it onto the clothes rack, bringing another painting a dress painting out and putting it on um, to keep on changing the composition until um, the viewer feels that they've arrived at the best composition for them and leaves it for the next viewer. And to finish off this uh, business about working, this is a piece that I'm currently working on which um, is not finished, but it also involves a relation to um, clothing. Um, through clothing, of course, you get to textiles and cloth, and which has got a fabulous history um, that points to 
um, many different kind of conversations that one could have. And um, this painting on the go is uh, combining the kimonos that I've made with, um, with fragments of Japanese prints and looking at um, through the fragment of, 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 of kind of what we, what we can know about something or not know about something, something appearing and kind of disappearing. So that's a kind of um, an overview of my work. And thank you so much for your patience in listening to me um, here um, along those lines. Thank you so much. Um, oh, you on? Hi. Hi, thank you so much, Lisa. That was, it, that was amazing looking. Am, am, I, am I coming on? Yep. Come on, okay. Yeah, thank you so much. It was, it was, it was such an insightful um, talk and to see, to see kind of the inner workings of, of it. And one thing that I kind of think really stood out for me, which you talked about, was um, how important kind of looking and making is. Um, and it, it kind of reminds me of being an art student, having this massive anxiety of how do I make a work about something? How do I make, you know, I, I kind of thought I had to come up with a, an idea first and then make work around that idea. Um, where it's, I think it's really refreshing. I think lots of people have the same anxiety and it's great to realize kind of that slowing down and realizing that looking is so important and how to look um, in different ways and where to look and how, if you're aware of that, you can say a lot about the world and about yourself, which I think your kind of work really kind of has highlighted. But I'll, I'll part, I won't say too much now because um, I think it's really nice now to open up to some questions. Um, so I'll pass on to um, Gabe now. Thanks. Hi, thank you, Lisa, so much for that. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Um, before we get going with the Q&A, any more questions that um, anyone has or comments about Lisa's work, just pop them in the Q&A section and we'll get to them, hopefully. Um, the first one is a mixture of a question from me that I had before and from David in Kakuma. Um, and it's actually about your travels and how starting in Vancouver and then going to different places you've been, how have those places had impact on your work and particularly also, um, from spending time in Kakuma, what inspiration have the refugees given or had given to you on your work? Okay, well, there seems to be two questions there. One is about my relation to travel and one is about um, my, um, my, my connection with Kakuma. Um, I think what I'm going to do is start with the, with the aspect of the travel. Um, and so travel has, has always been um, a really um, defining experience in my life, growing up in, in Canada, um, coming from Vancouver on the West Coast. Um, my, my relatives uh, um, on my mother's side of the family lived in central Canada in Manitoba, and they were um, of Ukrainian background. And, um, and I would spend all my childhood summers with my brother and sister, with my mother's side of the family in, in, um, in Manitoba, which meant leaving um, the city of the city on the west coast, defined by the mountains and the oceans, um, for um, the flat prairie plains, um, and uh, into a small farming a, a sm small farming village. Um, where we, the language was Ukrainian, we ate Ukrainian food, heard Ukrainian music. I had my Ukrainian outfit and learned dancing and my grandmother taught me how to make beautiful Ukrainian um, Easter eggs. And so there was this kind of sense of, of travel and moving between different cultures and different geographies, different histories, um, right from a, an early sort of time within my own childhood that, that was, was very marking in some way, made a, a huge impression on me. And of course, we, we never learned, my brother and sister, I never learned Ukrainian, but we heard it all the time. And it, there was within this the sense of, of not being able to really fully understand something that was, that was around me. And so the sense of, of travel also opening up a curiosity about um, what I, I could know or couldn't know or what could or couldn't be shared um, sort of chimed with then um, this sort of the, this, this sense of um, how I've been talking in, in my overview of my work um, about, um, about looking at um, notions of same and difference, for example, or the, um, the relation between the group and the individual. And when I decided that I really wanted to study um, art and come to 
and, and do that in England. Of course, it was another, another shift of, of leaving Canada and moving to London. And, um, and so, it, again, encountering um, differences. Um, the language was the same, but not the same. And understanding through the language was proved very, very different, for example. Um, and just uh, discovering a sense of time and history here that was so different to my sense of time and history growing up on the West Coast. Um, and then um, throughout my, um, my career, I've had wonderful opportunities to work abroad. And, um, and notably, I spent a lot of time in Japan. And, um, and so th there's this sort of sense of, of how one connects um, entering in and traveling to somewhere that is unfamiliar to one, um, where you seek out the things that are familiar, how you negotiate things that aren't familiar. All of those questions um, in a lived kind of way also um, um, inform my, my sort of my, my painting thinking, if you like. And so the, the travel um, um, has, been, has, has been really sort of fundamental to something that I've really enjoyed and um, um, to date. And of course, during these times, in um, thinking about travel going forward, one really wonders what the status of, of travel will be for artists and what I will come to think of travel um, when we emerge um, from this period impacted by COVID. So does that sort of cover something a little bit about travel? Yeah, completely. Thank you. It's really interesting to hear how that okay. So moving on to the second question. Um, in fact, um, I met Sue Maholland through our mutual visual art programs that we deliver in Kukuma Refugee Camp in Kenya. So just to give you a bit of background on that, in 2015, <clears throat> excuse me, I set up hands-on art workshops with the support of Vodafone Foundation, which is Vodafone's charitable arm, and the UNHCR, the refugee agency. And through their partnered Instant Network Schools program, which provides digital uh, learning, I'm able to meet students in Kakuma Refugee Camp regularly at their schools through video conference here in London and deliver practical art workshops in live interactive sessions through the screen. And I travel annually uh, to Kakuma Refugee Camp, working with UNHCR Education um, to engage with students directly. Um, so, um, I was due to travel to Kakuma last month, but as all mission visits to um, Kakuma refugee camp were suspended due to COVID um, and travel to Kenya not possible, um, I was unable to meet up with the students and colleagues in Kakuma um, as planned. And with schools closed there, um, it wasn't possible for me to connect with students through the screen, um, and it's not going to be until the schools and cities reopen. However, um, I've been liaising through WhatsApp with um, the headmistress at the school um, in Kakuma, where my program is mostly based, and through her mobile phone and SMS connections to a few students within Kakuma, I've been able to offer um, the art workshops via WhatsApp. Um, and so using WhatsApp, the headmistress texts me images of the students' paintings and drawings um, in response to certain workshop guidelines that I give them. Um, and I'm able to respond with comments and suggestions. And so it's been so surprising the way the phone has opened up um, another way of communicating with students and um, delivering art workshops. Thank you. Is, is there something more along those lines or does that yeah, that covers it completely perfect i think amelia's got a couple yeah um i wanted to ask if um and how studying abroad in paris i think um how it affected you and your art and if you'd recommend studying abroad to younger viewers well it's of course case by case but for me um I fell in love with European painting pre-900, uh, 1900, um, uh, in Vancouver in my teens in the 1970s through um, art books and through fridge magnets and through calendars. And um, at, in those days, um, being able to kind of look at, um, at European painting pre-1900, it was 
not not at all easy in Vancouver at that time. Now, of course, it's um, it's 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 much more available and um, and accessible. But in those days, it wasn't. And it's really curious when you fall in love with a painting without ever having really seen it in the flesh, as it were. Um, um, just on that note, for example, I'm going to um, show you with this painting here. This is um, a postcard that the RA made of this painting when it was shown in the summer uh, in the summer exhibition last year, and I just wanted to show you it in relation to the actual painting. The painting is huge, and you can see with the painting that um, I don't know if it's blurred, but you can see that it's a raw canvas very, very different kinds of paint quality here. When you look at the reproduction, it sort of turns all that materiality into a flat image. And so, um, and so the whole sort of feel of what an artwork can be in terms of its material presence um, is really affected by how you see it on a printed page, of course. And I think one of it, the interesting um, challenges is how to use technology. Um, to really key um, the materiality and the objectness of a painting. Um, so as to sort of bring it alive through that channel, not just through the graphic imagery of it. However, um, it was through... Um, sorry about that. It was, it was more through um, books um, that I hatched my love of, of European painting. And so I... I really, really wanted to come and be able to look at the paintings in the flesh and to be able to kind of study at an art school where um, it was possible just to, um, just to have access to those paintings. And I really wanted to go to Europe. Um, and of course, it's hugely challenging to do something like that on all sorts of different levels. Where's the money gonna come from? How are you going to manage feeling homesick? What's it like when you don't really know anybody in a new country? All sorts of very logistic, challenging questions um, sort of came my way in how to manage it. But by hook or by crook, I got there. And, um, and uh, so for me, um, it was absolutely sort of amazing to be able to arrive and wander into the National Gallery for free, into Tate for free, and, and discover all the paintings that I had I had looked and enjoyed sort of on the printed page. Um, and those wonderful museums all over the country um, with their fantastic collections that are so freely accessible, they're, they're just like a heartbeat for me in terms of how I, I sort of then um, based my, my study um, in, in, in London. So that's a bit about my personal story and how I came to be here. Um, but of course, everybody will have their own reasons for wanting to study abroad um, and face their own individual challenges in how, in how to do that. Thank you, Lisa. Um, we are running a bit short on time, so I have one or two more and some kind of quick answers on them will be really helpful. Um, oh, that's impossible for me. <laughs> My answers are always five minutes long. All right, um, all right, one line answer. Do you think that your love for order is also reflected within your paintings? Yes. Um, what is your oldest brush? I don't know. Um, but when I was getting them out, this one, uh, this one is quite old and it might be coming to the end of its life soon. And whenever a brush comes to the end of the life, I thank it profusely before I put it into the bin. And I'm mindful of, um, of a wonderful ceremony that happens in Kyoto where calligraphers bring their brushes to a particular temple when their calligraphy brushes have reached the end of their life and they put them into a ceremonial fire and burn them to thank them. So when your brush is, comes to the end of its life, thank it for the good service that it gives. Thank you. And the last one to finish on, why shoes particularly? Why shoes over clothes? Oh, um, well, one one they're beautiful. Perfect. Beauty, beauty, beauty and pleasure. All right. Thank you, Lisa, so much. Um, we're probably going to have to wrap up there. Um, but thank you to Lisa. Thank you to Gabriel. Um, and thank you to all the guys behind the scenes for making this talk happen this today. 
Thank you very, very much to everybody. Thank you so much for joining me. It was great that you could all come on board and enjoy your, enjoy your art and may your creative juices flow. Wonderful to see you today and bye for now.